everyone uh, and a very warm, warm welcome. Um, my name is Orla Stafford and I'm a senior manager in human capital in Deloitte, Ireland. Uh, Deloitte are, are really proud to be sponsoring this webinar and um, I'd like to thank IT Cork for inviting me here to MC today's session. We have a really interesting topic to focus on, inclusion in a remote and hybrid workforce. Uh, we'll be discussing this topic with a strong panel made up of John McAvoy, Gráin O'Keefe and Clara Walsh, who will introduce themselves in a couple of minutes. Uh, so I'm really hoping that you'll all uh, really enjoy today's conversation. Before I kick off the session, I'll just take a minute to introduce myself. Uh, as I said, I work in human capital in Deloitte and I lead out in the workforce transformation offering in Ireland. Uh, I've been with the company about a year and a half now and I actually joined the company virtually during the pandemic. And it's really only in the last month or so that I've started to go into the office and to meet the team. So it was a bit of a strange start for me and it's also very relevant to this topic of inclusion today. Prior to Deloitte, I worked in Accenture for 11 years in their human performance practice. Uh, I then went out on my own uh, and I was an independent change and HR consultant and executive coach. And across my career, I've worked in all things talent management with my focus on developing people and enhancing their performance. Specifically, Deloitte do a lot of work in the, in the diversity and inclusion space. Uh, I myself have worked in a wide variety of companies in this topic over the last couple of years. I've been involved in developing companies' ED&I strategies. Uh, I've completed a number of EDI i audits and diagnostics, and also been involved in delivering board and group-wide company training, as well as inclusive leadership training. Uh, I'm really passionate about the whole topic of EDI, uh, and I'm also actively involved in Deloitte's strategic partnership with Insurance Ireland, and work with them on their annual insurance and brokers uh, diversity inclusion survey. And I also regularly do webinars like this and talk on this topic on behalf of Deloitte. So enough for me. Um, I'd love to invite the panel just to do a brief introduction of themselves before we begin. So uh, maybe, John, if we could start with you. Yeah, thanks a million, Arla, and uh, to IT Cork for organising today and, and inviting me to be part of this. Uh, as, uh, as Arla mentioned, I'm John Evo. I'm General Manager at, at Grow Remote. Um, with the organisation about a year and a half now, and obviously uh, remote working has been such a topical uh, uh, you know, topic of discussion for, and, and our lives have changed over the last uh, year and a half and remote working has been at the centre of that caused by the pandemic. Um, for that, I, 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 I set up the Irish Manchester Association and I worked at Rethink Ireland. Um, but, re, you know, Grow Remote, I suppose, we're passionate about remote work and the transformative effect it can have on, on our societies in particular, our communities and, and towns and villages, but also that it, we know it, it works well for, for everybody, for people, planet and profit. And uh, yeah, and I suppose we're here to help build out the entire remote working ecosystem so it benefits everybody. Um, really looking forward to the, the discussion, Orla. Thanks. Great. And uh, Gronia, maybe you could introduce yourself now. Yeah, delighted to be here. And thanks to ITR Cork uh, for inviting me. Uh, so um, my name is Gronia O'Keefe. I'm CEO of the Logate Digital Hub in Skibreen. Um, I joined in July 2020, so also in the, the height of the pandemic. So it definitely has been a strange old journey over the last two years. Um, I suppose for those of you who don't know Ludgate Digital Hub, and I'll be very sad if you don't know of us, because I would like to think we have a presence out there. But for those of you who don't know us, uh, we were the first rural digital hub that opened our doors back in 2016 when we were very fortunate to receive one gigabyte connectivity from the Vodafone Syro partnership. And on the back of that, we've been able to showcase how essentially rural revitalization can occur on the back of high speed connectivity. And we've seen that Minister Humphrey's rural policy uh, in the Department of Rural and Community Development has taken that very much on board and she's now launched a campaign to, um, you know, set up and establish digital, digital hubs across, you know, dotted across the landscape. So I, I feel very passionate about rural revitalisation. I also feel very passionate about diversity and inclusion in women in the workforce and gender, uh, closing out that gender divide. And I, before my time in Ludgate, you know, even though I'm a Skibreen girl born and bred, I would have been one of those kids forced to disappear uh, at 17 off to university and never to come back. And now, fortunately, I had a fantastic career path uh, around London, Tokyo, New York with the investment banks and was able to benefit from, from that wonderful career. But I suppose when, when, when you have three kids under three, uh, sometimes you have to make choices. And I made a choice at that stage of uh, self-selecting, I suppose, to opt out for a period of time uh, as a, a career that requires 60 hours of effort, uh, working away from the home on a regular basis where this flexibility and hybrid working did not exist at the time. Uh, it kind of forced me into that self-selection, that opt out. So very passionate about diversity and inclusion, very passionate about right, uh, rural revitalization, and I'm very happy to be here talking about both of those things today. Great. 
Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Fonya. And Clara, lastly, if we could, uh, if you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Clara Walsh, and I am the Operations Manager um, at Workfuel, and I'm delighted to, to join this panel today. Um, I'm coming up on four years at Workfivo, where I was really fortunate to be one of the first employees that John Goulding and Joe Lennon, our co-founders, brought on board. So I've seen us grow from being a company of four to over 100 um, over the last four years, which has been an incredible experience for me. And I've gotten to see so many areas of the business and um, Workfivo itself. Uh, so we are an employee experience application that brings your whole company together in, in one place. We've over a million users across 90 countries um, using Workfivo. So we work with um, over 200 companies um, and some amazing um, brands and companies, including VMware, TELUS International, Mercedes-Benz, Lululemon, and then some really great Irish um, companies like Boss Aaron, Woody's, and some universities. And basically, Workfivo gets rolled out within all of these organizations and becomes the central hub for communications. So we were founded in 2017 uh, by, by John and Joe, and we are a very proud um, Cork startup which um, is the centre of the universe and Skidreen is, is the home of all things Olympics. So we, we let you have that one, Gronia. But uh, delighted to, to be on the panel today. Great. Listen, thank you all. Um, and really looking forward to today's session. Um, just to say, as we progress through the webinar, if you have any questions for the panel, you can pop them in the Q&A and I'll monitor them and we might ask them as we go or we might get some at the end if possible. Um, look, before we start our discussion today, I just wanted to spend five minutes talking through some of, I suppose, the key challenges and also the opportunities that remote and hybrid working is surfacing, uh, just to set the scene before we open up the conversation uh, to the panel. Um, of course, we can't speak about hybrid working without mentioning COVID-19. Not only has the virus had a massive impact on our personal lives, it's also completely changed the world of work. The New York Times described it as a time machine that propelled us into the future we thought was decades away. In particular, it has accelerated the prevalence of hybrid working and has demanded so much from organization and their workers. I just wanted to share with you, I suppose, some of the research that was conducted in a recent Deloitte Return to Workplace survey um, with a number of companies around their intentions for hybrid and remote working. As you can see from the slide, 68% of companies we surveyed intend for their workplace to operate in a hybrid model, against 21 wanting to maintain an in-person culture. Researchers also suggest that 79% of, of the workers want flexibility in when and where they work. And, and with the great resignation, and as it was the war for talent, you know, companies that are offering this flexible working is becoming a truly attractive employee value proposition. And employees need to incorporate this into their strategy in order to attract and retain the top talents. But interestingly, only 57% of workers say that their organizational and culture em embraces this flexible work. When COVID-19 happened, almost all the corporate companies had to switch to remote working overnight, with many of their priorities based on survival. But now that hybrid working is becoming the new normal, priorities have changed. Culture um, was, was also a top concern noted, with 32% of respondents agreeing that they were worried about maintaining organisational culture in this post-pandemic world. So we've seen that you know, we all have seen how fostering an inclusive culture leads to better engagement, lower absenteeism and um, higher job performance overall. Uh, so it's something that you shouldn't be overlooked at all when operating in a hybrid working model. So this session, we're going to delve into the inclusion imperative for hybrid and remote working, and, and it really is a balancing act. Whilst remote work, <clears throat> whilst remote work reduces barriers, barriers excuse me, <clears throat> there are definitely factors that employers um, need to be mindful of and mitigate against. So as you can see, um, there are many benefits and opportunities to remote and, work and hybrid working. Um, first of all, it removes location bias and grants access to geographically distant talents pool. Um, so the thoughts of commuting or working in pot potentially inaccessible environments often led to people with protest protected characteristics to deselect themselves from applying to jobs. And bringing me on to the, my next point um, is that remote working has enabled disabled employees to work in settings that are customized customized to their needs, so often from the comfort of their own homes. This is especially pertinent to neurodiverse workers where physical workplaces place, can sometimes be overstimulating. The next benefit to remote and hybrid working is that flexible work, working patterns really are inclusive. So think of new parents returning from parental leave or people with caregiving responsibilities. So being able to complete their work in a schedule that suits them and keep them engaged and employees engaged and grants them autonomy to work in a manner that suits them. 
And lastly, around the benefits, remote, remote work has reduced some of the biases that arise in the workplace, and um, where people are more focused on task completion rather than perceived abilities. So this gives breathing space to people with protected characteristics who are concerned with being judged on visual cues that indicate a disability and allow their work to be in focus. Um, with the many benefits, however, um, there's also, of course, challenges that employees need to be very careful of and which can also hinder the inclusion efforts. Uh, firstly, research has shown that major concerns exist where proximity bias is concerned. So I suppose what is proximity bias? It refers to our tendencies to give uh, preferential treatments, example, extra tasks or promotions to those in our immediate vicinity, essentially the potential for favoritism. So it leads to this halo effect where we build an inflation views of those nearby when overlooking more qualified individuals who are further away from us. So like many biases, proximity bias usually happens unconsciously, um, but if leaders or individuals aren't aware of how it's occurring, it can be quite harmful to employees or your peers. So it's damaging because it ignores skills or expertise in favour of location and visibility. So the, this is definitely going to be a challenge in this new hybrid environment where people will be working both at home and at the office. So during COVID, we were actually all at a level playing field as we were all remote. So now this shift to blended working could isolate workers who choose to work from home and create this culture of a two tier workforce with remote workers potentially feeling like they may miss out on career and relationship building opportunities. So which brings me to my next point. Um, this is especially prevalent for female workers. Deloitte research has shown that COVID-19 has actually hindered gender equality progress as female workers have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 as they take on increasing amounts of responsibility at home and in their careers. And another risk to inclusion from hybrid and remote working is that collaboration does not exist as organically as it would in person. So there's definitely this potential for employees to feel excluded from collaboration when done so virtually, um, if, if the proper technology isn't there. And lastly, um, before we move on, just to say hybrid working can give rise to these feelings of isolation with remote workers feeling disconnected from their team who are in the office or even from an entirely remote workforce, fostering a connection um, and keeping engagement levels uh, high is definitely going to be a challenge. So look, that was just a little um, conversation warmer um, to get today's uh, to topic up and going. Uh, so we're going to kick off with um, some, some conversations with the panel. And I think um, the first question I'm going to ask is to John. Um, so John, following on from what I just spoke about, I just wanted to ask you a question about career progression. We've heard the location can be a barrier um, to inclusion in terms of career, of career progression, progression. So how do you think we might prevent this from happening? Yeah, um, thanks a million, Orla, and thanks a million for that like summary uh, of the challenges and benefits uh, of uh, hybrid or remote work. And I think uh, you, you really summarised it, it, it neatly. And I suppose just to say, um, we like while acknowledging all those challenges there, we, we feel that like at Grow Remote that those challenges can be overcome and it can be a very like um, high performing, highly effective remote and hybrid teams, and, and uh, that that works well for everybody. Um, yeah, location, uh, for, for, well, first and foremost, even apart from um, like it being a barrier to promotion, like, I, and I think you mentioned it in, in, in that summary as well, it can be a barrier for people even applying for jobs in the first place. Yeah. And that's a, that, that's a big thing. So like we all know, like if people talk about inclusion and diversity, and, and, we, and we all know at this stage, that things like people's uh, race or ethnicity or gender can you know prevent them for having the same opportunities uh, of, of getting different jobs and we'd argue that almost like location should be on that list as well so those people who maybe grow up in in some of the most remote parts of ireland some of the most rural parts of ireland and uh, they're not able to get those like in particularly pre-covid be, before this like transformation of how we all live and work uh, it was like the option was either to leave and go live somewhere else to get a good job or to uh, or to not get that good job so so like i think that was a, a like a barrier to equality that wasn't really ever discussed openly or maybe acknowledged or understood um you know and and then i suppose like part of the origins of grow remote was like identifying the problem that like what can we do for rural and regional areas uh, that's not been done before like based on like the uh, uh, obvious uh, like uh, observation that the main streets in lots of our small towns and villages were, were vacant and, and, uh, and empty and it was like wow there's this uh, like these hundreds of jobs that are available for anybody anywhere but people just don't know about them 
you know, and so trying to do something about that, make those jobs visible and accessible. But it, like, there's a big piece of work to be done. So just to give it an example, we know that one of, we, 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 we work with, with communities and we've got what we call chapters of remote workers across, across the country, uh, originally set up pre-pandemic to counteract the isolation that some remote workers may experience. But one of our chapters off the West Coast on an island, and like, you know, talking to like a young fella, uh, like 20 years old, working in the family pub and would love to be able to go away and get a different job, get a career in whether it is finances or, or, or tech or whatever. And, and just didn't know that you can get a job and live where you're living, you know, and still maybe contribute to the family business. Or, and there's, there's loads of other examples of people who might have care responsibilities for elderly parents or whatever, and moving away just is not a possibility. And then we start to talk about this is this is like pre-COVID as well. Start to talk about some of the biggest remote employers in the world, like Automatic or GitLab, and people just never heard of those companies, you know. And they almost said, "Oh, you can get a job and you can live on on the Iron Islands and you can get paid thirty thousand a year and you can, you know, for an entry level job and and you know full full pension and annual leave and all that stuff." And it's almost like, ah, that must be a scam, you know. <laughs> so it's like really. Uh, there was no understanding of this is possible. Like there's 80,000 jobs available across EU or, or, you know, our time zones plus one or two. Um, and, that, and all of those jobs could land in Ireland. Like there's a huge number of jobs that could land in Ireland. And uh, we feel our job is to make that accessible and visible. But there's, there's more work to be done as well as like, because I think uh, which has happened and, you know, and, and probably a lot of the companies that you work with, you know, it's, we want like the jobs that are available in all these communities not to be only the, you know, kind of tech companies or startups, you know, we want like really well-known Irish indigenous companies to be advertising uh, at least some of the roles fully remotely. And if they do that, then it means they need to they tackle all the challenges that you mentioned so that if somebody is, you know, working on one of the islands for, a company that's HQ'd in Dublin, that they've got the same chance of promotion, for example. Uh, we've often heard the saying, you know, you'll never get promotion over Zoom. But like, we feel you can if, um, uh, you know, if everybody, if there's like a really inclusive work culture and everybody's treated the same, whether they're in the office or in a different location, uh, whether that could be, you know, one of the 400 odd co-working hubs. I know Grania knows an awful lot more about, about that than me, but they're a great addition to the infrastructure to facilitate all of this. I'm also aware I'm talking a bit too much for my first question. Okay. Uh, so thanks a million, Orla, uh, well, I'll leave that out. A really positive message of, of inclusion. So thank you for sharing that. And, and moving on to uh, another question um, based on, on the slide that I presented um, to Gronia, if that's okay. Um, Gronia, the statistics of women CEOs at the global level is only 4.8% um, and you're one of them. So I'd love to hear your perspective. Um, research shows that our professional and personal networks have actually shrunk by 16% or more, um, or more than 200 people since the pandemic. So what are your thoughts on women's careers suffering, suffering disproportionately from the pandemic and halting, halting gender priority progress? Uh, well, thank you, Orla. I'm delighted to be here today to discuss diversity and inclusion. And of course, the appalling statistics tell us a very compelling story. Um, I think we actually have a very long journey ahead of us. And I don't think we can become complacent about any wins we've achieved to date, modest enough as they actually are. I mean, they're very slim pickings, really. Um, and according to a, a recent World Economic Forum report, it's going to take 135 years to actually close out the gender gap at the current rate of, of progression, progression globally. And, and even worse, in the economic participation and opportunity area of measurement, a whopping 267 years to close. Now, that's absolutely ridiculous and absolutely unacceptable. So, um, you know, we talk, you know, we tend to have these discussions and debates around International Women's Day. And that also prompts a lot of mixed feelings. You know, are we meant to be celebrating the wins or are we meant, is it meant to be a battle cry for the ongoing fight? And I certainly would view it more as uh, in the latter category, as I don't think we have enough successes under our belt to be declaring any particular victories. Uh, a few small wins, as I mentioned, but that's kind of about it. Um, we know that gender equality is important and research has shown us that it's good, uh, what's good for the greater gender equality is also good for the economy and society. But 
progress remains elusive. And uh, the statistic you've quoted uh, just there, it's very concerning. And while maybe, you know, me with the title of having CEO in, in, in my signature, that is contributing maybe to that particular statistic. But, you know, I caveat that with I'm in the public and the social sector space, you know, so it's not necessarily even contributing to corporate uh, statistic, which would be interesting to see what that is once you strip out social sector uh, organizations where women tend to have a, maybe a more active presence than in the traditional corporate space. So, so it's even worse, I suppose, is the point I'm making. <laughs> um, and uh, look, it's it's disturbing overall. And then if we look to see what the impact of the pandemic has had, um, uh, the pandemic ha has had uh, an adverse impact on the pre-pandemic stats. And it just illustrates the absolute vulnerability uh, of even maintaining those pre-pandemic wins. So um, I think what it's telling me really is that we need to take immediate and strong action to turn this around. And it probably means a whole host of measures across many different areas, because I don't think there is one silver bullet. Um, I think the measures required need to meet, the, need to meet the, the range of gaps that exist across the entire workforce, you know, whether it's the 20 somethings, the 30 somethings, the 40 somethings, the, the sector, is it tech, is it STEM, is it med, you know, whatever it is, is it women, uh, people who have uh, dependents, uh, do they have children, do they have elderly, uh, are they just back into the workforce after having a baby? And so looking at what are the unique needs and requirements there to retain people into the workforce, I think uh, it's a multitude of solutions that are required. Um, I think the measures that we were adopting pre-pandemic were, were of minimal value um, that allowed us, as I say, achieve modest gains, but they certainly don't go far enough and they're not working fast enough, especially if we go back to that alarming stat that I just quoted there, the 200 and, what was it, 267 years or something? Yeah. So, yeah, pretty awful. Um, and I think, though, um, we've seen how, I think there are nuggets of, of optimism out there. You know, we've seen how nimble and agile the government acted in response to the pandemic. Um, who would have thought that they would be able to, you know, revolutionize a response in such a way? I think we're now seeing a similar rapid response in terms of what's happening in the Ukraine. And that's great to be able to see that. But I think we need to now ensure that that ability and uh, agility gets transferred over to the gender gap. And I would certainly like to start seeing some of that nimbleness, that creative problem solving, uh, become embedded into that roadmap for solving for gender diversity. And of course, it all boils down to funding. Uh, funding is going to be needed to solve for many of these um, gaps. You know, we, uh, tokenism won't work. Uh, that will lead to the six, you know, 267 years, but we need funding. And, you know, affordable childcare, I would say, is critical in there. And I think were we able to solve for that, that would actually really uh, turbo boost us across a few decades to help us get past the century target, you know? So, yeah, we could talk about this for hours. So I'll just yeah, say, thank you, Gronia. I mean, definitely it's definitely a challenge that we need to still work on. And it was really interesting to hear your perspective on it. Um, I'm going to pass a, um, a, a question over to Clara to get her also involved. Um, so one of the things I'd like to ask you, Clara, I suppose, in your opinion, do you think that remote work can create opportunity for a more diverse and inclusive workforce? And also following on from that question, how do you create an organisation where people feel like they can be their, their true selves? Yeah, 100%. So I think really I can use the example of work vivo. So it's almost two years to the day where we all, you know, shut up shop and, and went home. And at that time, you know, we were a company of 20 people and now we're a company of over 100 people. So over the, the, the two years, we have trebled our headcount and onboarded a lot of people remotely. And I think, you know, one of your benefits on, on the slide here is the talent access. Um, the pool of people that we were able to hire from was was incredible and a really diverse talent pool which has meant now we have been able to hire some incredible people from diverse backgrounds and experience and what we've seen is that diversity and experience really fosters creativity and for us creativity is the center of everything that we do you know and that's in terms of if you're presenting a deck for a customer or if you are going up against for a sales prospect against a competitor of ours, that creativity really rings home. And we've just seen when you have a diverse workforce with different experience, our creativity has, has gone has gone up massively, which has been amazing. In terms of the inclusion piece, I think 
um, inclusion just doesn't happen. A lot of thought has to go in behind that. And what we've done really for our remote, remote side of things is make sure on a team level that you know every day you're you're meeting your team for a, a team stand up. You're seeing you know what's on the agenda, who needs a hand with what, is anybody struggling? And I think when we do join these stand ups, we're not straight into the work. We kind of chat and, and shoot the breeze up a little bit to really start building those relationships as well with the team that you know before a couple of months ago we hadn't met in person. So really having those those team stand ups every day across the company is really important. And having those multiple touch points throughout the day as well at a smaller level so that those who need a hand can get a hand and really just getting a sense check on how people are doing. I think um, when you have a new joiner and you're in the office, you could just you know look over your shoulder if you had a question. So it's being so important that people aren't sitting there after Zoom calls not knowing what they're doing. So having a correct tech stack so that employees are supported is really important. And you know we we use Zoom. We have a, a vast majority of tech available like Slack and, and Notion, and we're big work Vivo users ourselves. And I think having that support really helps not only um, employees we have today, but, but new joiners also. Um, in terms of the, the, the sense of belonging, I know you have lack of belonging as a, as a challenge, but having a sense of belonging is, is really important. And I think really for us, it's really down to the, the culture that, that John, and, John and Joe have created in Workfivo. It's a very safe place um, that everybody gets to bring their true self to work. And you see that on, on team calls and you see the, the personalities and the characters shining through. So I think when a new person starts, you kind of can let the shoulders drop when you you, you, you see the rapport on, on team calls. And really that allows people to let their guard down and, and bring their true self to work. And we've really seen that when you bring your true self to work, you bring your, your best self to work. Right. Um, thanks a million, Clara. That's uh, really interesting. Um, I'm going to move back to, to John, um, just to change it slightly. So John, from your experience of working with companies who've committed to remote and hybrid working, um, what technologies uh, can and are being used to help employees feel included, involved and connected and, and what supports are out there if an employer or employee is struggling with it, all of this um, or just wants to know more? I know Clara slightly touched on this, but maybe you could expand a little bit more. Yeah, uh, no problem. Maybe I uh, can't add a whole lot more than what, what Clara did. I think each kind of company gradually over a period of time decides on its own kind of software stack that it uses, whether that's you know, Google Chat or Slack or, you know, Zoom or Teams or, you know, and those core things that we all know really well that we've been forced to get to know and love, in maybe not love, uh, over the last over the last couple of years. And then I think like, uh, yeah, I think it's, I suppose when it comes to making sure that like hybrid or remote work works well for a particular company, there's a number of factors that need to be considered. And if you were to break them down into kind of three rough buckets, you'd have like culture, technology, and policy. And in, in a way, um, the technology isn't the most difficult. There's lots of really good options out there. There's uh, stuff, you know, coming onto the market all the time. Um, you know, and, and I think it's getting better, more user friendly. I think it's difficult for people to kind of, I think there, there can be a, um, a little bit of a kind of mental block and oh no, not another new piece of software I have to get, get to know. But I think like software is getting so um, kind of intuitive now that people adapt really quite, quite, quite quickly. Um, I think it's important for, and, and this goes apart from the technology right across the different things that people need to get used to, but plenty of consultation and communication across the team and, and where possible to make consensus uh, decision making, you know, and, but then I suppose there's a, a certain element of like when a decision is made to use a certain uh, piece of technology that everybody kind of gives it their best shot and dives in, you know, um, because we all have late adopters too who resist and stuff like that. So don't, don't, they're important conversations. Uh, but in, in terms of in, ensuring that like uh, remote um, work works well or a hybrid uh, model works well, it, I think the, the culture is the trickier piece of the three things across policy, technology and culture, you know, uh, and again, uh, but I think it, it's something, um, you know, that that's really doable. And like you would have alluded to in some of your sites, for example, the innovation or collaboration mightn't happen as organically as it would in the office but it definitely can happen if it's done slightly more intentionally. 
Uh, and, and so, um, yeah, it's just, I think there needs to be a kind of high level awareness about the challenges and then putting a plan in place to, to counteract them. And there's just there's a follow up question is just around technology and I may as well just address it now. Um, somebody was just asking um a question about um having cameras turned on. Um, someone was saying there we have a large neurodiverse workforce and it's recently come come up as part of a consultation we've gone through about the future of work, and we did a lot of pushback on this particular topic. So be interested on your view on this. So I just thought we'd address that while we're talking about technology. Yeah. So uh, at foremost, we would we wouldn't have. Uh, a strong opinion. I think what works well uh, for different companies works well for different companies. I think the main thing is to discuss it and, and, and talk about it. One, like there's different approaches. Um, one of, uh, like I mentioned GitLab earlier, and if you look at their uh, free um, online training for like managing uh, remote teams, um, one of the things they talk about is that people have to manage not only their time and their energy, but their attention. So in some cases, it's absolutely fine to join a meeting and not really pay attention. You know that you're there, you're kind of like a fly on the wall. If something comes up that's relevant, it's for you. Where as other people, like there might be some meetings where it's really clear, like you have to pay attention, you're participating. Um, so I think it's it's good to discuss all of that. I think it's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if there's a, like neurodiverse considerations, I think they're like, very powerful on the top of the list and whatever works for people is what works. Yeah. Anyone else, Claire, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, 100%. I think to follow on John's um, point, it's completely up to, to the person. Where we can, we do push for camera on purely because, um, you know, when, when everybody's camera off you and someone's speaking, it's just a bit more of a, of a dialogue if cameras are on, I find. And I also find if somebody starts turning their cameras on, you'll get people will, will start doing that also. But if somebody doesn't want to be camera on and there's some mornings it doesn't suit me to be camera on, could have my hair in a bun or something. And, and that's OK, too. So I think it all depends on on the person and, and the type of meeting. But definitely um, I like camera on. That's just my personal preference. But you know, we join calls where people would rather not have their cameras on, which is no problem at all. So I think mandating anything, you'll always have someone saying no. So I think if you put the option to the person and let them decide what they want to do, I think that's that's the kind of best approach here. Yeah, I think the key to all of this is flexibility and choice. And I think that's really important as we move forward in this in, in this environment. And people have had that choice over the last while and to take it away from them um, would be would be, you know, a, a challenge. Okay, I'm just going to move on to, to Gronya actually, just to um, ask her a question. Um, Gronya, from your perspective, um, with Ludgate's co-working spaces, how do digital hubs ensure greater inclusion in the workplace? We think this is a bit of a game changer, really, because you know some of the the challenges that you identified in your in your slide earlier are, are actually where um, places like the digital hubs can close out in those challenges. So they'll offer the flexibility of not having to drive the two hours commute or the one hour commute and the approximate to where the employee lives, but they're also removed from the home. So you're not trying to do laundry at the same time, maybe, although sometimes that's handy, but not all the time. And, um, uh, and I think it allows you work in a professional environment with state-of-the-art facilities, but it also removes the isolation element. It also ensures that you are continuing to behave in a professional manner. You know, when, you, when you're at home, you can possibly go a little, well, I know I can start acting a little peculiar and it, isolation can do that to people if you don't have regular interaction with people. Um, you know, sometimes I might be feeling a little strange and you need independent verification to get you back on board, you know? So certainly if I look at what Ludgate has done to enabling um, inclusion in the West Cork region. Like a lot of the people who are working from here are working for either multinationals or scaling companies. Those opportunities wouldn't have been here before. So I think John, you said it beautifully earlier on, we've never looked upon location as a barrier before, right? Never. We talk about gender and we talk about lots of other um, gaps that are out there but we've never viewed location. And certainly me being, as I say, a child of Scabrina and left leaving at 17, and I wasn't unique. I was, you know, everybody left at 17 if you're going off to university. Most of us not returning, unless you were lucky enough to have the family pub or the family farm or the whatever, right? So so I, and and, and we're actually very intelligent down here, you know, uh, as I'm sure lots of rural Ireland, there's a lot of intelligence, you know? So we were, we were 
it wasn't an option for us before and now this is we talk about the war on talent and um that there isn't that there's shortages of all the talent there's a lot of talent that exists today it's just the unlocking of that talent and enabling them to come from wherever they are and i do think the digital hub network will enable that i think john what you were saying about remote and the was it eighty thousand jobs or was it i can't remember how many jobs we've we've certainly taken the remote jobs that you guys have created and grow remote and dropped it into our uh, our digital, our Ludgate website, so that we are offering, we're amplifying the transparency about those positions. Because, you know, we just want economic revitalization for the region. Ludgate is a social enterprise, right? So as long as this area is thriving economically and socially and culturally, we've achieved what we set out to achieve. And I think a lot of the digital hubs would, would, would share that sentiment. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. That's really interesting. Um, I'm just going to ch change it slightly again now to, and move to Clara. I just want to understand, um, I suppose, from your perspective, what are the challenges of onboarding in a remote world? And um, what, what is that like for people now? Yeah, um, I think we've, we've onboarded more than 80 people remotely. So we, we definitely learned, learned a few lessons along the way and, and, and came into some challenges and bumps. But the great news is I think there's, there's some key things you have to get right to make that seamless for the, the new person starting and straight away this might sound small but making sure that that person has their laptop and their mouse keyboard monitor before they start so on that very first day they're they're ready to go and also to communicate what what that first day looks like you know a couple of weeks in advance so they know okay i'm jumping onto this zoom call and you know who am i going to meet next and what we have found as well is we almost do a very, very structured very first week that is almost timelined so that the person knows what's in store for them and sets the expectation. But definitely for us and, you know, when you start remote and, um, you know, you we want you to meet as many people as you can. So whatever team you join, we do a, a Zoom call and you will meet the entire team. And then you will start to meet the other teams and other people from, from different teams. And we also put the new joiner under a little bit of spotlight and, and, and pressure. We make them, you know, ask them to introduce themselves and if they're comfortable on WorkVivo to post a photo and just a little bit of a, a bio about who they are, what they've done um, in, the, in their past experiences. And then every week the whole company gets together, which I think has been a really great piece for, for us, you know, even we used to, our very last uh, week at work, Bevo was in the room, a really small room. I don't know if we'd fit in it right now, but to get everybody together every week, it's amazing. You hear from sales, marketing, product, CX, and it just gives you an insight and, and transparency into what's going on across the business. And we also make the new person introduce themselves here. We claim you have to sing a song, but we've yet to have one person sing. So whoever does will, will, be, will be amazing. But yeah, it's just being, I suppose, really deliberate about that person's onboarding, make sure they've lots of check-ins. Like I said, the last thing we want them to do is get off the Zoom and there's no one around them to ask them anything so that they know who to chat to, make sure that they're supported. Um, and one piece that, um, John, I know you mentioned it was the whole culture piece. We have, we did an exercise at the end of last year where we put pen to paper to write down what our work people culture is. We didn't just do this because we are remote now. We, we did this because as we scale from 100 to 150 to 200 people and beyond, we want to bottle up what work people is and, and what the culture is. So we asked all of our employees um, at the end of last year in a survey, what makes work people work people? What do you love about work people? What makes work people different to the different organizations you've worked in in the past? And from that now we've built our culture code and every new employee, one gets brought through that culture code when they start. So they know how things work here, what it's like, what are our values. And we also have those values then on work Vivo to bring those to life as well. So I think it's just showing that new hire, you know, everything like it's almost they need to be a bit of a sponge at the beginning to know who's who, but also what it's like to work here and, and what is work Vivo. And I think um, we've learned a lot of lessons. And if I was to take if you were to take anything away, all I would say is ask your new hires how the onboarding was. Because we've had 80 new joiners remotely, we always ask for feedback. How can we approve our onboarding remotely? What did you like? Is there anything we could have done better? And from that, I think we've now really learned how to successfully onboard people um, remotely. 
Great. And I mean, this is, I mean, I, I was saying to you earlier that I joined um, Deloitte remotely and, you know, I'm a very much a people person. So it definitely was a challenge. I mean, Deloitte did a, a super job and they did all of those things that, that you've said similar to that. But I mean, there is still nothing like going for a dinner with someone or a coffee or a walk, because no matter what, those first couple of minutes, you might do the small talk, but you don't actually really find out about the person in the same way. So I think it's balancing it. And I think it's really important. Um, and, you know, everybody needs to kind of, I suppose, make the effort. Even for me now, it's an effort to go in. And um, we can go in as, as often as we want. That's the way, or as little as we want at the moment. That's the way Deloitte have it. But for me, it's almost an effort to go in. And even though I'm so social and I do like to talk to people, it's sometimes easier to stay at home. So it's trying to figure out what works for you and, and get the balance. And I'd actually love to add to that, Orla, that I completely agree there. And I think the really big thing of onboarding during the pandemic and onboarding right now is you onboard and, and you didn't meet the team for months and months. Yes. So although we might be remote first, we're not remote only. You know, you there is going to have to be face to face. And right now we have, you know, with the quarter closing up, almost every team having an on-site somewhere. In May, we're having, we're luckily having our fifth birthday. So we're getting the whole company together for the very first time, which will be amazing. But I couldn't agree more. You you will need that, that social touch point, but it's just understanding what works for the team and what works for the people as well. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree more on that. Great. Okay, another question, slightly changing, and I'm going to pass back to John. Um, how could some of our current societal changes affect the remote work landscape? Example, the war and the refugee crisis, crisis or inflation, specifically uh, fuel costs. Yeah, so um, obviously there are big challenges and, and, and uh, the, the stuff that's going on in, in the world has a much wider and broader impact than it does on each of us going to work every day. Um, However, like it, it there, there is knock on impact. Like even to take the inflation and the fuel price piece first, I think there's been just in the last couple of weeks uh, a lot of conversation about you know people returning to the office and all of a sudden that it costs twice as much than it did to to commute back in edge uh, before the pandemic. And that was a factor that mightn't have really been considered when people were thinking about, you know, filling out their surveys about how much they want to go back to the office, like, you know, in their endeavours and like to, you know, to see their teammates again, which is all absolutely perfect. Uh, but but I think it, it is a, hu a huge factor. Uh, and, and um, you know, anyway, we know that, like, I'm not, I suppose, an economist or like can't really offer insights more than maybe that are already in the public domain uh, around. I know the government are trying to do something about fuel prices. But again, it, it's that uncertainty, I think, is, is a big, a big challenge there. And I think also, um, you know, with the, with the refugee crisis now as well, or, you know, that uh, like remote work and, and different type of work is, is it's at least... I suppose it's something nice that we can offer, you know, that there's there are opportunities for new arrivals to get good jobs, you know, and and, and we're already like doing something small to try and facilitate that grow remote. But I know there's tons of other uh, well-established organizations trying to do important things as well. But I think it I think what all this tells us that it's it's just such a, a fast paced and ever changing landscape, you know, that we have to try and continue to understand. I know even in times of the, like times of less turbulence, uh, you know, it was something like people have been trying to get working in the office right for something like 100 years and it was continuously evolving. We're really on this like remote work hybrid journey only for a couple of years. So it's the very start. It's going to continue to evolve and like we'll have to take in, I suppose, everything that's going on in the world into account as we try and make it work for everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, another question that came in in the chat, and actually it came, I might give it to Gronia, but anyone can answer. And um, it just came in when Gronia was speaking. It was, I'd like to know your opinion on salary discrepancies across Europe and how to have conversations with talent hired in another European country who's earning less for the same position compared to a colleague working in Ireland. Just an interesting one. Yeah, I think that's a, a very interesting and no doubt could be troublesome for the organisation. Uh, you know, equal job, but we know the cost of living in different countries uh, is different and I presume that a global organization takes all of those sorts of things into consideration. Uh, look, in my prior life, I was working in New York, London, and I was working on a New York, London salary. Would I love to get that in Skibreen? Yes. Uh, do I expect it ever to be available to me? No, because my cost of living here is much, much, much less. And um, 
this look, Orla, you're you you're in human capital, yeah. and I, I'd be interested in your thoughts as well as to how that's going to get solved for her because, you know, I suppose now we're going to have to start publishing some degree of of salaries, certainly with gender uh, pay. Is it each company? Do they make it transparent? And I know a lot of the recruiting companies will will show what you can get for what function in what region. And I can say I've looked at what the price discrepancy or the salary discrepancy is between Dublin and and West Cork, for example. And yeah, it's significant. But as I say, my cost of living down here is far far less than what it would be in Dublin. So I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as yeah, well. I, mean, I, I suppose. I mean, I think really, I suppose clear communication. I think you know for that very reason, if there is, if they are going to be working on that, to be able to understand and explain why the salaries might be different, so that people can understand. I think I think there's it's going to be a challenge for everybody to, to to work on this now and I think it's something that I think a lot of people haven't really thought about or discussed um, I'm not sure if, if those salaries need to be disclosed and then that might something that may came, come at a later stage um, but yeah I think it's we're really at the beginning of the journey on this piece. Um, can I jump in there Orla? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so this is something we've been looking at in some depth quite recently okay. like and uh, I think um, a compensation philosophy or compensation policy is something that every organization needs, particularly if it uh, hires or, or has employees in different jurisdictions. Um, there seems to be kind of a number of choices that organizations can make. One is that like, you know, same pay for the same work regardless of where you are. Uh, one is like indexed, you know, to the headquarters, uh, like with, with, a, with a, a cost of living consideration. Um, uh, and one that like seems to be most popular is like uh, cost uh, minus. So if it if we're headquartered in Ireland and we've got people in other countries, we pay the same gross uh, as you would in Ireland, but any costs that are incurred, such as additional employee tax or you know um, or a cost of uh, employer of note service or employer record service that they that comes out of the, the gross. And I think the main thing with that is that that a company has a philosophy or a policy and that they stick to it and that it, that policy is is transparent. So people know exactly what you said, why they're getting, why they're getting compared to compared to others. Uh, and I think like it would be fantastic to get like San, San Francisco salaries in Cork or Wexford. But, you know, I suppose it's, it's unlikely, unfortunately. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, just I want to go back to an, a question that's in the chat as well. And, and we kind of slightly covered it, but this person's looking for some tips. So this person is a, a, is a leading all Ireland's employee resource group in a very large multinational company. And they have a voluntary team of over 10 from across many business units that help support employees across Ireland and work in hybrid and remote environments. And they said that they, like, they sent out a survey. One section of the survey was around social and inclusion. We got a lot of people missing face-to-face -face meetings and saying they miss networking with folks who are outside of their inner networks or their inner work circle. And they miss bumping into folk in the in, in the company and they don't want to, they don't work with every day. So any advice and tips on that? I know we discussed it, but I suppose is there any advice and tips on, on how that this works well and that any of the panel can share? Um, and I think this is where we're we're we and also on the back of that, the second question is is that you're going to have some people who who stay at home more and then others who don't. So there's going to be almost a divide of people who meet up more regularly than others. So and how, how might that work? Well, I, I, I do think digital hubs can resolve some of those issues. Now, the people you'll be bumping into might, might necessarily be your, your colleague from your own company, but you're still bumping into other professionals. And that opportunity to be able to troubleshoot a problem or try and crack a, you know, a dilemma can be done. And you know, without sharing state secrets of that particular company, some of the problems are pretty generic, you know. So um, I do think the, the Digital Hub not only offers the, you know, the appropriate facilities that an employee might need, they also have proximity to the home more than likely. And then they do offer that ability to interact with other people, um, maybe actually not even from your own sector, which actually allows for a lot of cross-pollination. And um, so, so, you know, we, we have flexibility and agility here. You don't have to sign up to us for three years. You can sign up to us for a week. You can come in one day a week. You can come in one morning a week. You can have one desk that the company uses. And for example, we might have that with uh, some people on this particular call today. So um, there's a lot of flexibility and solutions that are out there. It's not a one size fits all. It's look to see what your needs are and then look at what the problem, what the possible solutions are that are out there and how to solve for them. I do certainly think between Grow Remote and the digital hubs that are scattered across Ireland, 
we're probably further ahead than some other countries, um, I think, in solving for this remote and flexible hy the, the hybrid workplace. Thanks. And, and anyone else, anyone, um, Clara or John, would you be? Yeah, I can, I can uh, definitely see that myself. You miss the, the water cooler moments or just even randomly bumping into staff. So what, what we do is we have two social calls in the diary that are completely optional. They're on a Tuesday and a Thursday and they're coffee catch up. So you can jump on and you never know who's going to be on it. And it's just a really great way to have those social calls. So again, you just need to be deliberate about having those calls in the diaries. People know they're optional, you don't, you don't have to attend, but if somebody would like to, they certainly can. I also think one thing that I've noticed is, um, as much as it is amazing to do face-to-face, -face, not everybody might be able to be in the room, so you end up having the Zoom element anyway. So I think it's just being deliberate if you're having a face-to-face, -face, is everybody going to be in attendance in person or will there be a Zoom element? So I think even if you can find that happy medium and, and have the tech to support some people in the room and some people joining remotely, I think that would be a, a nice medium as well. And one thing that we've started doing is um, you know, setting up calls with people, and this might scare some people with no agenda, you're, it's a 15 minute catch up to say hello. And some people might be like, oh, what, what do you want to talk about? But that's what meeting in the office was, you know, you would just randomly bump into people. And um, I think when you have a Zoom call set up, there's a purpose for the Zoom meeting. And when, you know, somebody is just saying hello on Zoom, I think getting into that mindset um, is really, really great. And I know there's some tools that integrate in with Zoom that, you know, will select two random people to jump on a Zoom within the company. So there, there is some tech approaches that you can you can take to that issue. Okay, well, thanks, thanks a million. Um, another uh, question that's come in is, how do we support employee resource group, uh, groups in remote companies? So is any, any of you would like to take that one? Sorry, I don't really know what that means. <laughs> So employee resource groups are specific groups who are set up for it may be uh, LGBT or maybe working mothers or it may be, uh, you know, for race, whatever else. They're specifically set up to, de to deal with something. John, you guys published a book, didn't you? A playbook the other week. Um, that would be kind of one of those scenarios. It, it did. I don't think it was mentioned. Uh, how, uh, unfortunately, we did. We, we yeah. launched the remote playbook for, for SMEs. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for the plug, Grania. <laughs> <laughs> I'm following you closely, John. Uh, and then, the, like, it, it, it does cover a, like, a broad yeah. range of uh, a, a broad range of topics that all kind of SMEs have, have to tackle. Sorry, I was, I was just thinking carefully of the, of the, you know, the question that was uh, sent in there. Um, yeah, uh, so there, there's lots of resources out there, but I'd be, I'd, I'd be hesitant to answer that one. Yeah. That's okay. All right. Um, I suppose uh, just, to, I mean, any other, I mean, I'm trying to think, is there anything else that I suppose we've only got a couple of minutes left? Is there anything, a uh, topic that anyone would like to, to discuss or bring up that hasn't been covered in here from the panel? Well, I suppose just, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Ron, if you like. Well, I, I was just going to say it's about not being afraid of it and embracing it yeah. and but realizing we're all actually on the journey and we don't necessarily have to have the solution tomorrow morning as long as we're having the open dialogue about it. And that, I think, is what the beauty of today's session was about. You can see we don't have all the answers yet, right? We're, but we'll yeah. figure them out together and uh, and as a cohesive unit and, and it is going to be an ongoing narrative for quite a while and an ongoing debate. I mean, the government hasn't even got it resolved. They tried to publish the legislation there the other week and that was, you know, that caused a lot of fireworks and turbulence. So we're all figuring it out. We're all in it together and mm -hmm. there is no one size fits all. You have to figure out what works for your company and then see if the solution exists. And if it doesn't exist, talk to people like Brewer Moat or the Hub Network as to whether that meets the, your needs. Thanks, Tony. Um, anything else, John, you were going to say something? Yeah, just uh, in, if people wanted or any companies who have uh, attendees here today, uh, we are lucky enough in partnership with uh, ETB and Solace to be able to offer full, fully funded training in leading remote teams and in, in, in thriving remotely for all other colleagues, which is uh, those, those programs go into a lot of the topics that we touched on today, but in in a lot more depth, um, and it's brilliant that fully funded, so no cost to the companies. Perfect, thank you. And Cara, do you want to finish up with a? Yeah, my, my fi final point, just because it's so fresh and for us right now, is ask your employees what suits them. I think if any company starts mandating you have to be back in the office, the 
like the talent pool and market right now is is insane so i would just say ask your employees what their preference is before making any decision because we have done that and some people yeah want to be back in the office which is no problem some want hybrid and some want fully remote but really having that open dialogue to understand what suits the person we've we've had such great flexibility from working from home so i think it's just continuing that and seeing where where this evolves to next which is a who knows but very exciting <laughs> Um, well, I suppose uh, we've just a few minutes left and actually a commitment I've made to myself, um, which has been really useful, is to try and set my meetings up for 25 minutes or 55 minutes so that I get a couple of minutes back between meetings because we're going back to back to back and it's very, it can be stressful and you, you need a moment to get a coffee. So with that saying, I'm going to give you all three <laughs> minutes back um, to your day. Um, I, I just, I hope you found this really interesting session. I really did. Um, thanks Amelia to, to, to you all for joining and to IT Cork for, for setting up this uh, webinar. And thanks to our panel, um, John, Bronya and Clara for your time, time today, as well as your really inter interesting perspectives. Um, that's all from us, and I hope you all have a great uh, rest of the day. If I could just say one thing, I know that there's a request there for John's playbook. John, maybe you could send it to IT at Cork and they could circulate it to the attendees? Yeah, 100%. I've yeah. just uh, put the link into the chat as well there, but I'll send it around as well. Yeah, I'd be glad, glad to do that. Perfect. Super. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks a million. Thanks a million. Bye-bye.